Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. I want to start out by wishing everyone a very happy and very belated new year. I'm finding it really hard to believe just how quickly the last few weeks of last year and the first few weeks of this year flew by. Needless to say, I'm super pumped to bring you this new episode of the show. Before we get going, I've got a bit of a holiday gift for some of you. That's right. Over the last few weeks, I've received a few requests from listeners who've wanted to listen to the podcast on their favorite home assistants. Well, it's taken a bit of doing, but I'm happy to report that the podcast is now available on both Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Check this out. Alexa, play the podcast This Week in Machine Learning. You'd like to play the program called This Week in Machine Learning, right? Yes. This Week in Machine Learning and AI, getting the latest episode. Here it is from TuneIn. Hey, Google, play the podcast This Week in Machine Learning. Learning an AI podcast, Twimmel Talk number 10, Francisco Weber, Statistics versus Semantics for Natural Language Processing. Note that for whatever reason, Alexa doesn't like when you ask for the podcast using its full name, This Week in Machine Learning and AI. But This Week in Machine Learning works fine. On Google, either works. If you have any problems, just repeat the commands that I used in the demo. Now, I like to think that at least some of you are listening at home on your phone speakers, and I've just commanded your device to play the podcast. If that's the case, enjoy it. Nice. All right, moving along to our program. This time around, our guest is Hillary Mason, who I interviewed last year at the O'Reilly AI and Strata Conference in New York City. I don't know that she'd refer to herself this way, but Hillary was really one of the first quote-unquote famous data scientists. I remember the first opportunity I had to hear her speak was back in 2011 at the Strange Loop Conference in St. Louis. At the time, she was chief scientist for Bitly, the company that popularized short links on the web. Nowadays, she's running Fast Forward Labs, which helps organizations accelerate their data science and machine intelligence capabilities through a variety of research and consulting offerings. I tracked Hillary down at the AI conference after hearing from an attendee that her talk on practical AI product development was their absolute favorite session. Hillary and I had a wonderful, although somewhat brief chat that I'm sure you're going to enjoy and learn a lot from. Of course, you can find this week's show notes at twimmelai.com slash talk slash 11. And now on to the show. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Hillary Mason of Fast Forward Labs, and we're at day two of the O'Reilly AI conference, uh, the first actual O'Reilly <laughs> AI conference, as we were just discussing. That's right. And uh, Hillary gave a talk yesterday that I didn't get a chance to see, but I heard great things about it. Oh, so thank you. Uh, why don't we start by having you introduce yourself, and uh, then you can tell us what your talk was about. Sure. So I'm Hillary Mason. I'm the founder of a independent machine intelligence research company called Fast Forward Labs. And we look into approaches and algorithms that are emerging in the machine learning AI space, but that are not yet widely understood. And we do our own independent research to make them useful to people. Um, So we write reports that are a survey of the techniques from a technical perspective at a conceptual level, talking about where we think it's going to go, any ethical issues that might come up. Um, do a survey of the commercial landscape, um, so what vendors are out there, what we think the interesting application opportunities are. We also build working prototypes of these things. And finally, we act as technical advisors to our clients, like their nerd friend, um, and help them actually build their AI machine learning products more effectively. Nice. Um, so, yeah, that's what we do. Uh, Everyone t- needs a nerd friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all have that friend. Even you know, if you are a nerd, you have your nerd friend on on your music nerd friend and your uh-huh. friend who's most likely sitting in front of a computer at nine p.m. You know, right. we all have those people. Right. right, right. So your talk. What was the title of your talk? So my talk was practical AI product development. Um, 
And what I was trying to accomplish with this talk was uh, coming into this AI conference, there's a lot of hype and a lot of um, lack of clarity around what it means to actually build an AI product, um, what an AI product is. So what I was trying to talk through are some of the challenges we see in going from the idea and the algorithm, um, going from the press release, if you want to say it that way, to the product. So being able to say, uh, we have a data set, we have a business problem we understand, and we have some, you know, we're willing to invest in trying to make something. How do we actually do that? And how does it differ from um, data analytics? And how does it differ from software product development? Because a lot of people today are trying to take uh, a machine learning product and sort of put it into the software development framework. And they tend to run into a few common friction points when they do that. Okay. And so I suppose those friction points were the body of your talk? Yes. So um, things like how agile software development is really optimized for building a product with commodity technology. Uh -huh. um, but that isn't how you build a data product. Um, because you have to understand that maybe, even if it's a good idea, sometimes the algorithm you've chosen won't work. Um, you have to make sure that the accuracy of the system is within sufficient bounds. Um, there's a lot of work to do around how you productionalize and operationalize these things, how you monitor not just that the server is up, but that the model continues to return high quality results over time as the context and the data changes. Um, and so all of those details are something that you really have to learn right now by doing it. And we have yet to really standardize on a common accepted practice. And so in my talk, I was sharing what we've learned and what we do, and then hoping to have conversations with people around what they do and what they're trying to do. Um, and so, yes, that's what the talk was. It seems like Agile would be perfect for this environment where, you know, things like uh, working closely with your customer, the end user of your uh, your product, um, you know, failing fast, kind of at least the things we commonly think about agile. There's also a whole software development lifecycle thing, which may be what you're referring to. Right. But. So, so on the surface, it's absolutely a compatible philosophy, the which idea. is why everyone falls into exactly. the trap. Exactly, <laughs> um, because when you go to implement the details, is when you run into the problem. When you have to say, you know. How long do I, how many points will, do I think it's going to take me to find an algorithm that can produce a useful result? And it doesn't take into account the machine learning process of, of uh, developing, really experimenting and saying that, you know, I might try to solve problem A, but it turns out problem A is really a lot harder than I thought it would be, but I can solve problem B that's also useful in this product context. And it also doesn't deal with the, um, once you have something that sort of works, doing the simplification and scalability work, which is just as hard as the initial algorithmic work, um, but often gets overlooked in a, you know, AI con conference where everyone's excited about what's shiny and new. Okay. So to me, that says that it's not that agile methodologies are fundamentally, you know, ill-placed in these types of problems. It's that our sensibilities for estimating and, you know, understanding the development process that kind of feed into an Agile methodology are off. Like so, we don't so have, I would say we don't agile have our MLC legs yet. Right. They agree. But the, the mechanisms are second class citizens. So you can allocate mm. a spike time to go figure out an algorithm, but that's a hack. And yeah. there's no first class mechanism for this sort of experimentation and iteration. Okay. Okay. And so how did you, um, with that being kind of the premise for your talk, what were some of the things that you, that you dove into? Uh, so I love to tell stories. So I talked about a couple of projects we've attempted that didn't work out. So one was using a deep learning image classifier to let you take a picture of your plate and get a calorie estimate, okay. which, okay, that sounds, maybe that sounds like a good idea. My team, we thought it was a good idea, at least worth trying. We found a lot of data. There's a lot of food photography out there. Um, and there's also a lot of data on, you know, a cheeseburger has this many calories. Right. It did not work because that data, um, a cheeseburger can have anywhere from 300 to 2,400 right. calories. And these data sets just simply don't agree. Uh, and we did, you know, first we're like, okay, we want the actual calorie count from the plate. And then we decided on a more modest problem, which was, can you tell us if it's very healthy 
healthy or not at all healthy. Uh-huh. And eventually we uh, decided that it was no longer worth the time and investment um, <laughs> because the, the quality of result we could get was not actually useful. Right. And of course, this is a fun story to tell because a couple months after we did this whole process, Google announced that they had in fact solved this problem. Uh-huh. Um, and uh you know, to me, that sort of validates that it was a good idea, but we didn't have the resources uh, to make it work. So I talked about that story. I also went into depth on uh, Brief, which is an extractive summarization prototype we built using neural networks for articles. So being able to take an article and pull sentences out of that article that are an effective summary of the entire content of the article And that's something where there's a product design piece and there's Uh an algorithm design piece and they have to work together well in order to make a usable, useful, fun prototype. And so so I went through that whole example in the talk. Uh, Can you talk about that one in a little bit more detail? How did you go about that and what was the process like? Yeah, so um, so the work we do is always framed around an application. And so as much fun as, as it, is, it might be to say, like, okay, we want to spend four months using deep learning to analyze text, which is really what we did, um, we decided to focus first on summarization. And then under summarization, there's sort of two major schools of system. One is extractive, so pulling words and sentences out of the body of text. Um, And there's abstractive, which is constructing a summary that may contain language that does not appear in the underlying text um, that's new language. Uh, We focused on extractive because, again, in the product context, we could actually build something with a high enough quality result to be useful. Whereas Mm -hmm. on the abstractive side, we're still, as a community, very early. Um, And so the results are kind of variable. So, again, there was that focus. And then within that, you know, we looked at a couple formulations of the problem. So one is, can I take any article um, and extract those sentences? And that's uh, the system we ended up building. It's trained on about 18,000 human authored summaries with quotations of news articles. Okay. Um, and it works very effectively on those. And we also did a second formulation of the problem around multi-document summarization. So if you have 5,000 documents on the same topic, can you cluster them effectively and then summarize each cluster? And for that, we used LDA for that first step. Um, And actually, my colleague Mike Williams will be at Strata tomorrow talking about all of the technical fun stuff underneath it. Um, Yeah, if you're interested in that. Okay. And so for that that example... The data set that you use was that a public data set? Or? Yes, it's from a website called the browser, which is the, the terrible browser. website name um, because okay. of the ambiguity there. But um, yeah, so it's a public data set um, and one that turned out to be quite effective. Oh, interesting! And uh, LDA latent Dirichlet allocation? Absolutely. Uh, and how does that? I've heard that come up a few times. I don't really know how it works. What's the 30,000 foot on that? Okay, so the quick conceptual overview is that um, it's a non-supervised or unsupervised algorithm, meaning you take the stream of text and it is able to infer uh, related clusters in the text fairly effectively. One of the limitations is that you have to tell it how many clusters to look for, which you may or may not have an intuition for going into an analysis. Um, which again means that practically the way people handle that on any given body of text is to sort of try 10 clusters, 100 clusters, and then narrow their way in uh, intuitively. And by clusters, are we talking like n-grams or are we talking conceptual clusters? Uh, we're talking groups of documents in this particular okay, case. So it. we applied it to Amazon product reviews, okay. um, and we found particularly great uh, results in the pet product review category because this is a, a section where people are quite passionate about the the <laughs> items surprise, they surprise. yeah it's, it's no surprise I guess um, but we were you know a couple of uh, examples we ran into were things like a dog toy that um, you know ninety percent of the reviews were five star and ten percent were one star and so when you look at the clusters of those reviews you see that you know most of them are things like this is cheap I can buy it at Amazon it's great this is really good for my dog's emotional well-being and yes people are very concerned with their dog's emotional well-being and then the the 10% were sort of like yeah my dog ate part of this and had to have a $4000 surgery oh, wow. um and so that's the kind of structure you're able yeah. to pull out with LDA okay. um and uh the utility there I think is fairly obvious um 
or, or rather, one of the things I, I mentioned in the talk is that we tend to see these algorithms applied to making things we already do more efficient. So if you can make that 20-page article down to two pages, that's making me more efficient. But if you can make me able to read 5,000 documents, which I could not possibly, I right. could not possibly ever stand to read 5,000 reviews of the same dog toy, I can tell right. you that. <laughs> um, but now I can get a similar amount of value. Um, that's sort of a, a really useful AI product. Um, and when you say a similar amount of value, what was your, what was your optimization function? What were you... How did you measure whether the value was similar? Um, so that's a really good question. And in the case of our brief prototype, we had, um, you know, some human curated test data. Uh, but to be honest, a lot of this is really uh, intuition, which I know is a dirty word in this context, the world right. of AI. But I, I really do believe in the value of um, user testing, feedback loops, and human mm -hmm. intuition and guiding the product aspects of these this sort of work. Mm -hmm. So what were the, uh, did you have a, kind of an enumerated list of takeaways for the, from the talk? Was it prescriptive or was it? <laughs> so it was more laying out a shared vocabulary okay. um, and then sharing some experiences, but I'm not going to presume to tell you how it's done right. um, because I think that where we are in the development of the practice of, of AI product building is still very early. And this is, um, you know, I've been a data scientist since the very beginning, and it's very similar to what happened with the evolution of the profession of data science, where a lot of people are doing a lot of different interesting things that are all related. Um, but there's no one vocabulary, no one process that everyone has agreed on yet. Right. And so I shared my point of view. I got to talk to people afterwards for an hour and a half out here, um, hearing other people's point of view. And it, right. it's just, we're at one of those really exciting moments, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you done, have you uh, sat in on anything else at the event? Like, what else do you think is, is cool and interesting um, kind of in this realm? So at this particular conference, one thing I'm really impressed by is the different perspectives in the room. So most of the conferences I've been to are either technical or sort of business or sort of uh, product d design. Um, here we have everyone in the same room, uh, which is great. You know, VCs, business folks, startup people, big company people, um, you know, software developers, machine learning professors, all here. So that's really cool. Um, I've heard a couple of, um, you know, I always love the opening keynotes. They were pretty great. Um, and then there have been talks on everything from, you know, TensorFlow for Mobile Poets, which was Pete Warden's talk. And he has a great blog post if you haven't seen it. Um, all the way over to the future of natural language generation um, from the folks at Automated Insights. So it's, you know, just a few of the things I've been enjoying. Yeah, nice, nice. So how long have you been doing Fast Forward Labs? So Fast Forward Labs is uh, going to be two and a half years old soon. Okay. Um, and we are eight people plus two interns based in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. We're yeah. in Brooklyn. We are actually moving our office this week over to Atlantic Ave Barclays Center. Oh, wow. Um, cool. So, yeah, you or any of your audience should uh, let us know and come stop by if you're in the neighborhood. Nice, nice. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got a meeting to run off to. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's great to get an overview of your talk. Uh, yeah, it's great to have this conversation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Hilary. All right, everyone. That's it for today's show. A quick note for you guys. Tomorrow, I'm off to Rework's Deep Learning Summit in San Francisco. If any Twimmel listeners are attending or will be in the area, please reach out to me. I would love, love, love to connect up with you. Also, please do leave a comment on the show notes page at twimmelai.com slash talk slash 11 or tweet to me at at Sam Charrington or at twimmelai to discuss this show and let me know how you liked it. Thanks so much for listening. Catch you next time.